I wouldn't say that I'm afraid of flying, but I'm not gonna lie. Every time I get on a plane, my hands get a little bit sweaty, especially as we're taking off, my heart starts to beat fast, and the same thing happens when the plane is landing. So I can't imagine to have been on this plane on January 15th, 2009. It took off from an airport in New York with Captain Chesley Solenberger at the helm. 155 people on board, and before it reached cruising altitude, in fact, it didn't even reach 3,000 feet. They hit a number of birds, and the plane was going down. So just imagine being on an airplane and hearing the captain yell out, brace yourself for impact. I don't know about you, but my heart would have beat out of my chest because in that moment, you are completely at the mercy of the captain being able to find a place to land. Now, you probably know the story because of the movie with Tom Hanks that the plane eventually landed on the Hudson River and Chesley Sullivan was a hero and all of that. 155 people survived, no one was killed, and it was a miracle. But every time we get onto a plane, there's this realization that we lose control. I mean, somebody else is steering. Somebody else is in charge. Your life is quite literally in somebody else's hands. And I think as much it is, as it is for me, this sort of um, quasi fear of flying, it's also this idea that when we step onto a plane, we're out of control and we like being in control. I mean, I don't know about you, but I like holding the remote control, right? Can I get an amen? I like holding the steering wheel. I like driving in a car more than I like riding in a car, unless I'm in an Uber or Lyft, but you know what I mean, right? Um, uh, we like making our calendar and being able to go do the things that we plan on doing. We like having enough money to be able to provide for ourselves and those we care about. We like living in the most powerful country in the world. It gives us a sense of control. We like feeling smart. We like um, feeling like we have the ability to shape our life to be exactly what we want it to be. Some of us even use religion because we like control. Um, if we interact with God in a certain way, then he's going to give us exactly what we hope for and what we pray for in the exact way that we want it to. And see, our love for control is equally matched by our hatred of losing it. And if you're anything like me, over the last seven weeks, we have been inundated in a school of what it looks like and what it means and how to respond when we lose control. So how are you doing in that school? <laughs> what type of grade would you give yourself? I mean, it was a little bit easier at first, right? Where we were just told to stay out of large groups. And then as the um, constraints grew and grew and grew and our lives shrunk more and more and more, that's been more difficult, hasn't it? I've sensed it stirring up some things in me. I mean, we are the land of the free. And right now we can't even go into a grocery store without a mask on and we can't go to a park or go to the beach. I mean, we've lost so much of the control that we have grown to love. But I do think there's something core for us as followers of Jesus to grapple with during this season. Because being a follower of Jesus is a lot like boarding a plane. Uh, we give up a sense of control over our life. It's sort of like a, a stay-at-home mandate. There's some limitations and there's some constraints to being an apprentice to Jesus. And see, one of the earliest temptations for Adam and Eve was the temptation to seize control. I mean, there was two trees set up in the garden. One was the tree of life, and the other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the promise of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was essentially, you can decide. 
You get to decide how your life goes. You get to discern what's right and what's wrong. You get to call good good and evil evil, and you don't have to report back to anybody. That tree allows you to have total control. And that was the tree that Adam and Eve chose. And I would suggest to you that it's the tree that a lot of us choose. Even as apprentices and disciples to Jesus, it's the tree that we still go back to. And I want to suggest to you that this season of COVID-19 lockdown is unearthing some of our latent desires to remain in complete control of our life. And so today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the scriptures and we're going to ask Jesus what he wants to say to us in this season, specifically about control and what it looks like to live with a posture, not of control, but of surrender. So if you have your Bible, will you turn with me to Mark chapter eight? We're going to start in verse 31 as we look at one of Jesus's most prolific teachings. I'm rarely aware of how much I love control until I start to lose it. And Jesus is going to challenge us on that. And in Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 31, he's setting his face towards Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross and he's going to start to teach his apprentices, his followers, his disciples about what, about what it looks like to live in his way. Here's what he says, beginning in verse 31 of chapter 8. And he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days to rise again. Jesus in this text uses his most, um, the most common term that he used to refer to himself, the Son of Man. It's a term out of Daniel chapter 7. It was a picture of a ruler that would come and not only rule over Jerusalem, but eventually rule over the entire world. It was an eschatological term. And Jesus applies it to himself. But he contrasts it with this idea that the Son of Man must suffer, must be rejected. And for Peter and the disciples and the Jewish leaders, the idea of having a suffering Messiah was an oxymoron. It was anathema. It just didn't equate in their minds because they had in their minds sort of the idea of a pagan God that would come in with power and violence and grandeur and would rule with an iron fist. And this wasn't the way that Jesus was coming to rule. And so in verse 32, it says this, and he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He began to say to Jesus, hey, all that other stuff, Jesus, you've been saying, I'm on board with that. But this idea of suffering, can we talk about this a little bit? I think you've got your wires crossed a little bit. And he rebukes him. It's this really strong term. It's the same term that Jesus uses when he quiets the wind. He rebukes the wind. Or in Mark chapter 9, Jesus rebukes a demon. It's a way of saying, you're off course here and you better get in line. And it's what Peter said to Jesus. As you can imagine, that didn't go over so well. And in verse 33, we see the way that Jesus responds. It says this, by, but turning... And seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. So he says, hey, Peter, I'll see your rebuke of me, and I will raise you a rebuke of you. You're out of line, he says. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, if you're new to the scriptures, um, this, this phrase, get behind me, Satan, is not a compliment. It wasn't a turn of a phrase. It wasn't like the way that we say, oh, that's sick, or they're killing it. No, 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 no. This is Peter, Jesus saying to Peter, you are operating in the way of the adversary. You are standing in between me and what God's will is for my life. This, this, the word Satan here just is a title for the adversary, the person that's going against God. And 
Jesus tells Peter, that's the way you're operating right now. Get behind me, Satan. It's what we might say to somebody if we were um, on a diet trying to lose some weight and they showed up at our house with like Krispy Kreme donuts. Get behind me, Satan. Or um, with delicious Esco Gelato ice cream, right? You are standing in between me and a goal that I have. Get behind me. It's exactly what Jesus says to Peter. But I can sympathize with Peter. I don't know if you can. A few verses earlier, Jesus said that um, he was, Peter was the rock that his, he was going to build his church on. And now he's saying, get behind me, Satan. I think Peter represents the best and the worst of humanity. That some days we can be really in line with what God's doing. We can surrender and release control to him. And then other days we just want to control everything so badly. It's really interesting because the second part of verse 33, um, Eugene Peterson's translation in the message says, you have no idea how God works. Peter, you have no clue what's going on. Or in the ESV, it says, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And that's essentially what this text is boiling down to. What perspective do we have? And are we willing to see things from God's point of view, through God's lens, or are we going to hold on to the way that we think things should go? The way that our plan is set to work. Are we going to hold the remote control? Are we going to hold the steering wheel? Or are we going to, as Carrie Underwood so poetically put, say to Jesus, you take the wheel. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And see, here's the big idea that we're going to circle around today, and you can write this down in your notes, that a posture of surrender is the pathway to abundance. The posture of surrender is the pathway to abundance. I love the way that Evelyn Underhill wrote it when she said this. She said, we mostly spend our lives conjugating three verbs, to want, to have, and to do. And we end up clutching and craving and fussing, and we are kept in a state of perpetual unrest. See, when we say to Jesus, here's the way it should go, and here's what we should do, and here's my agenda and my blueprint, and if you could just execute it, that would be great. We lose the abundance that Jesus designed us to walk in. So what if, what if, by way, raising, raising that white flag of surrender, we actually walk into the life of flourishing that Jesus designed us for? See, that's what he's going to go on to teach his disciples, how to actually walk in the posture of surrender. I think it might be healthy for us to admit that there's a way that seems right to us. There's a way that we think people should treat each other. There's a way we think the world should operate. There's, a, way, there's a, a thing that we think God should do even. So I think today it might just be healthy for us to at least admit that. And see what Jesus rebukes Peter for. Listen again to verse 33. Here's what he said. He said, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And we're going to see this contrast all throughout this text. But the first time we see it, and I want to invite you to write this down, this contrast. Peter has this decision. Will I repent or will I defend myself? See, the invitation is to repentance rather than to defending. See, if we're not willing to be corrected by Jesus, we can never become disciples of Jesus. We have to surrender to the process of change and the process of growth. We have to find out that we're wrong about some things. Um, I had a mentor one time who asked me, Ryan, if you were wrong, would you want to know? 
It was an interesting question and it stuck with me. No one had ever asked me that before. And I responded after thinking about it for a moment and said, well, yeah, absolutely, I would want to know. Did you know that one of the reasons we read scripture is to find out that our thinking is, is off? I mean, listen to the way that Paul wrote it to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God might be competent, equipped for every good work. Reproof. That means to in our in our inner being to be convinced that we need to go a different different way, or correction. It means to reform something or to straighten something up that's been crooked. And all of this happens so that we can live more fully and more for good in our world. But it's it's painful finding out that we're wrong. Yeah, the, the Bible's word for this is repentance, to change our thinking, to change our mind. Martin Luther wrote that all of life is repentance, and he's right. He's right. On Saturday mornings, I make pancakes for my kids, and we have a pancake breakfast most Saturday mornings. And here's what I've realized. I've realized that the longer I leave that bowl full of batter in the sink after I've made the pancakes, the harder it is to clean. And I think the same thing is true with sin in our life. The longer we live in it, the longer we walk in it, the longer it sits along the side of that bull, the harder it is to clean. So the invitation today is if you hear his voice, if you find out that you're wrong about something, a way that you're thinking, a way that you're living, the invitation is to change and to do it quickly so that we can live in his kingdom with his joy. And so maybe right now, if you're on your couch, watching with your family at your computer or watching alone, like what if right now you just took your hands and you opened your palms and you just quietly said to Jesus, Jesus, if there are things I'm wrong about, I wanna know. I I wanna receive your rebuke so that I can walk into my life. I plan on repenting, not defending myself. Friends, this is the way of Jesus. So after rebuking Peter, Jesus gets into his teaching and listen to what he says. He says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So you'll notice what Jesus is doing. He's giving a teaching and instruction to both his disciples and anybody who was around who would want to come and to follow after him. Isn't it really interesting, though, that he gives a teaching about discipleship to his disciples? Because the reality is, is that letting go of control isn't a one-time decision. It's a daily surrender. And we have to continually do it. It's a daily choice. And so Jesus paints this picture. It's threefold. All of these instructions, these commands mean something a little bit different. But let me give you sort of the big umbrella that they all fall under first, and then we'll fill in the picture a little bit. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. The big idea that Jesus is driving home, this contrast between the way of God and the way of men, is that we empty ourselves rather than exalt ourselves. See, the way of man, the the way of people is, let's exalt ourselves. Let's lift ourselves up. Let's get all the praise and all the glory that that's where real, true life is found. But... What Jesus is teaching is something very counterintuitive, and it goes against the grain of what's inside of most of us. It echoes back to this parable, this metaphor that Jesus would use, that unless a grain of wheat dies and goes into the ground, it doesn't produce life. The, The way to life is actually through death, through emptying, rather than exalting. 
but he gives three commands. And I want to unpack each of them for you and give you something to write down underneath this big category of emptying rather than exalting. The first is deny yourself. And here's what I want you to write down. Relinquish your pride. Relinquish your pride. See, death to self, though, is not the same thing as the death of self. Death of self, which Jesus does not mean here, suggests that we need to deny our personality or even our our natural wiring or maybe even some of our heart's desires that aren't bad or evil. And that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. He's talking about death to self, releasing the desire to have to have things my way and opening myself up to God's leading. See, death to self could be epitomized by the Apostle Paul's teaching in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so Paul's saying, he's not saying he's dead, literally. He's saying that there's something in me that's died, that's been crucified with him. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He's calling us, Jesus is, to reject any sort of self that we have constructed and projected that doesn't originate from the center of the life of God and intimacy with him. Now, let's pause and admit that this is very countercultural. This is not what you're hearing when you pick up the book about self-help or even a lot of some of the Christian books that you'll find in the bookstore about how to live your best life now. This is not what you're going to find. But it is the invitation from Jesus. See, we're really used to the idea of Jesus dying for us. We're not quite as used to the idea, though, of us dying with Jesus. So let me ask you, what might that really look like? Like in real everyday life, maybe it would mean a few of these things. That we no longer need to manipulate people to try to get what we want. That we no longer are concerned with what people think about us. That we no longer, are, uh, we no longer think that we know best or that it should happen this way. We no longer defend ourselves to get the final word. We no no longer looking to see what kind of response we get from people or response we hoped to get from people, but we live without worry of what we will get in return. We're no longer obsessed with ourselves. You know, I read this week that the Amish have far smaller mirrors in their homes because they just don't care quite as much what they look like. We no longer operate under the auspice that my wants are ultimate. I love the way that Jan Johnson wrote about this because she summarized sort of the thrust of this and she brilliantly captured it when she wrote, Does death to self sound too hard? Well, it's a lot easier than living for yourself. It's this contrast of where are we going to put our energy and what are we going to give our time and our affection and our thoughts to? It's the death of, of pride, certainly. To relinquish our pride like you, when I've been going out, I've been um, wearing a mask over my face most of, most of the time. I, I didn't obviously wear one today, but you know, when you're wearing a mask, um, you can tell if you have bad breath really quick. Like I had this pasta salad, delicious pasta salad this week, and it had a bunch of olives and uh, pepperoni and salami in it to the glory of God. And I ate that. And then after I went out afterwards, I was wearing my mask in the grocery store. And I'm like, wow, I have some really, really bad breath. And I started to think about this text and I thought, what if we had a way of alerting ourselves when we're starting to assert ourselves rather than deny ourselves, where we're starting to operate in pride rather than in surrender? It's the picture that Jesus is painting for us and it's the invitation. Here's the next two, and I won't spend quite as much time on these, but he says next, take up your cross. Now, for the Jewish people in the first century, this was not primarily seen as a metaphor. It was literal. It was a picture of a a man being condemned to death. 
But for the Jewish people and for Jesus, this was a real possibility for people who would follow in his way. That 11 out of the 12 disciples were killed for their faith. And while we in the West, we most likely won't have to make that decision, will I stay true to Jesus or will I end up dying for my faith? That's not the case for a lot of our brothers and sisters around the world. They have to make that decision to take up their cross and follow Jesus for some people still today is a death sentence. But let's be honest, that way doesn't seem right to us. If we were to design the world, if we were to sort of create the world from scratch, I think most of us would probably try to create it without any sort of suffering. I mean, some of our deepest questions for God revolve around why? Why the pain? Why the death? Why the suffering? Why all the crosses? What's going on with that? But for Jesus, this wasn't just something that he was going to do on behalf of human beings. It was something that he was inviting them into to participate with him. In fact, the Apostle Paul will write in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, And if we are children, then we're also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The call is to participation. We might phrase it like this, that the way of the king, which is a cross, is also the way of the kingdom. Now, certainly, Jesus' death on the cross paid for all of our sins. He was our substitute. He provided atonement for us. But he also gave us a model to live out. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously wrote in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, when Christ calls a man he bids him come and die. We are not called only to admire Jesus, but we are also called to imitate him. And what is the cross all about? The cross is all about self-giving, sacrificial love on behalf of another. In fact, the scriptures would say, we know what love is because Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Love is defined by the cross. And so when we deny ourselves and take up our cross, we are giving ourselves in love. We are giving ourselves in love. And that's the picture, whether it's in doing the dishes whether it's in forgiving somebody, whether it's in doing the most menial task we could imagine that we're hoping somebody else does before we get to it, this is what it looks like to live in the way of the cross. And finally, Jesus says, follow me. Deny yourself, relinquish your pride, take up your cross, live in the way of sacrificial love, and follow me, or yield to my direction, Jesus would say, yield to his direction. It's really interesting. If you look at Peter's life, the very first words Jesus says to Peter are, follow me. And the very last words he says to Peter, which we'll talk about next week, are, follow me. And the invitation everywhere in between is the exact same. And it's the same for you. And it's the same for me. Apprenticeship to Jesus is following him, living in his way with his heart. It's really interesting because when Jesus rebuked Peter, he said, get behind me. As if to say, Peter, you're getting out in front. Peter, you're, you're starting to try to take control. You're starting to try to assert yourself. You're not in the place of a disciple or an apprentice or a learner. Peter, you're out front. Get behind me. I wonder what ways Jesus might say that to you today. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. In your real life, in your COVID lockdown life, what might it look like to live emptying rather than exalting. So Jesus is a brilliant rabbi and he anticipates our questions. He anticipates us asking, does this actually work in real life? And so this is what he says in verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will 
save it. Or Eugene Peterson put it like this. He said, what good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? Yeah, see, Jesus anticipates what you're thinking. If I don't look out for myself, who will? If I don't fight for the promotion, I'll never get it. If I don't fight and claw for everything I want, I'm going to live in a terrible existence. And he makes a statement that says, oh, actually, no, it's just the opposite. If you keep fighting and keep clawing and you want to get that promotion and you live and die for it, you're actually going to die inside. And this word that he uses for life is the Greek word suche. And it means our breath or our soul. It's our distinct identity, the real us, the real you. And remember a few minutes ago when I said, listen, um, when Jesus talks about death to self, he's not talking about death of self. And here's how we know that that's true. Jesus is actually giving us a teaching that will help us become more fully who he intended us to be, not less of who he intended us to be. That this teaching right here, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, is not in contrast to Jesus saying, I want to give you an abundant and full life. Yeah, the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. So the final contrast we see between the way of man, the way of God and the way of man is that we receive rather than achieving. We receive rather than achieve. We find our true self not as we look for it, but as we live for Jesus. I think C.S. Lewis captured this so well when he wrote, the more we get what we now call ourselves out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. And I just want you to hear today that that is exactly what Jesus wants for you. He wants you to become the you that he knit together in your mother's womb. He wants you to become the you that he's always designed you to be. And the people that I've met that are the most content in life, the most at peace, and the most joyful are the people who have decided that continuing to climb that ladder of success and significance and more just isn't worth it. So Jesus says this in verse 36, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? He's intentionally using these uh, business commercial terms, profit, gain, forfeit, and return. And he's using those terms because they relate. I mean, we are always giving something in exchange for something else. The best example is time. We always give our time to something. Maybe you've seen that during the coronavirus lockdown. A a few weeks ago, or last week, I guess, I asked on my Facebook page, what's one thing you started doing during this coronavirus season that you're going to keep doing afterwards? And so many of the answers were about family. Spending time with family, reading books with family, going on walks with family, playing games with family. These people that have been in front of us, but we've just been so busy that maybe we missed part of the blessing that God was giving us. Maybe you've seen that your priorities have been off in some way. Thomas Merton once wrote, he said, most people may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find out when they get to the top that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. Yeah, we're being afforded the chance right now to reevaluate what kind of life we're building, what we're giving in exchange, um, what we're getting in exchange for our time, for our money, for our energy. We're being afforded the time to reevaluate. Friends, please don't miss it. This is the chance to say, Jesus, teach me what it looks like to deny myself, take up my cross and follow you so that I can save my life, so that I can heal my soul and become the kind of person that you designed me to become. Yeah, Peter didn't have in mind the things of God. He had in mind the things of man. And I think maybe we do too sometimes. 
So what if we repented rather than defended ourselves? What if we emptied ourselves rather than exalted ourselves? And what if we decided that we are going to receive from Jesus rather than trying to achieve for ourselves? We might find out that the posture of surrender is the pathway to abundance. So Jesus ends this teaching by saying in verse 38, for whoever's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the son of man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his father with the holy angels. So Jesus starts to point towards the end. But if you know anything about uh, the gospel of Mark, you know that it's written by John Mark, but most people think that it was dictated by Peter. It's Peter's account of the life of Jesus. And Jesus says, if you're ashamed of my words, if you're ashamed of me, and I wonder if Peter's thinking back to that time where he denied Jesus three times when he was, when he was crucified. I wonder if he's thinking back to the time where he told that girl next to a trash can, no, I've never known him. Or where he told the person that came up to him, nope, not me. It's not me that was with that Jesus. And then in Luke chapter 22, it says that he and Jesus, is Peter and Jesus' eyes met. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he'd said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And in verse 62 of chapter 22, it says, and he went out and wept bitterly. <laughs> now, when Peter, when John, when Mark writes, when the, if the son of man, if you're ashamed of the son of man, he'll also be ashamed of you when he comes in glory. He's not talking about some unpardonable sin. We know that because Peter was reinstated. I think what Peter wants to tell us is you never want that feeling, that feeling of letting down your Messiah, of not speaking up, of not being faithful. In an honor-shame culture, there was nothing worse than that. And Peter goes, I know the pain of that moment. And you don't want the pain of that moment. But Jesus is saying he's coming back. And when he does, we, he will recognize the way that we've lived. That's what he's saying. And so we surrender to Jesus daily, knowing that he has sealed our destiny. That's the invitation that Jesus ends with in this section of scripture. In 1865, the date was April 7th, and uh, General Ulysses S. Grant sent a message to Robert E. Lee, inviting him to surrender. And Robert E. Lee, he famously said that there is nothing left for me to do but go and see General E. Lee, and I would rather die a thousand deaths than surrender. But then he started to look at his men. They were depleted. They were running out of food. They were running out of ammunition and energy. And so he went, and on April 9th, he surrendered. And when asked what the terms of surrender were, Ulysses asked Grant simply responded by saying, stop fighting and start living. Stop fighting and start living. And I think that's the invitation that Jesus wants to give to all of us. Stop fighting against my way. Stop thinking that you know best. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, and find life more abundant and more full than you ever possibly dreamed, because the posture of surrender is the pathway to abundance. <laughs>